Our final talk in our first segment this morning is from Matt McClarty, the global leader of API strategy from MuleSoft. He has experience defining digital strategies, architecting and implementing APIs and microservices. He has also co-authored a couple of books such as Microservice Architecture and Securing Microservices API. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Satya. Great to be here. It's a pleasure to have you in our studio. So um, your talk is on composable data for the composable enterprise. Seems to be more relevant topic in many enterprises we see today, I guess. It's a perfect segue from Aaron's talk there, I think. Perfect. Although I'm probably going to, I'm coming from a completely different uh, angle, I would say. But the spirit <laughs> is the same, right? There's a, there's a lot going on in the data space. So I will just uh, share my... Let's screen. check your screen. Yes. Make sure you can see that. Is that good? It's coming up. Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. All right, Take thanks. it away if you're ready. Yeah, for sure. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, it's great to see Mehdi. He must have been in the middle of the night for him. So glad glad he was able to introduce things. Uh, someone, a friend of mine for many years. And, uh, and Mike Amundsen's keynote, amazing. Uh, kind of taken aback from that. I, I felt like I should re redo my entire presentation. But what I'm going to share with you today is is really to explore that that data topic in the context of APIs because it is a super hot topic right now. You know, in my job as a global leader of API strategy, I'm working with a lot of big organizations all around the world. And for the past for the past about 18 months, I've been zeroing in on this intersection of data strategy and API strategy. And I probably came from a place where I felt like, why are these different? But I've arrived in a place recognizing that really what we're dealing with are two different worlds that, to Mike's point, you know, go all the way back uh, in the history of computing. So this is a talk about the role APIs can play in, in dealing with the collision of the world of analytics and business intelligence and the world of distributed applications. So it's an abridged version I'm going to fit it into 20 minutes. There's a whole other version of this that has economic uh, concepts, but I'm going to zero right in on, on some of the more execution-oriented aspects of it, in, uh, and in respect to the to the execution track that I'm in. So first of all, you know, I think that it was 10 years ago, believe it or not, that uh, Mark Andreessen wrote that uh, essay in the Wall Street Journal that, that said software is eating the world. And I think at that time, explosion of mobile technology and you know, all these new second generation web startups like Uber and Airbnb and so on, um, we're, we're kind of saying, hey, look, software has to be a core capability for, for companies to thrive in this new digital economy. I think it's pretty fair to say now, 10 years on, maybe it's data, right? Is Maybe it's data that actually drives the digital economy and software is just there to facilitate it. Because if you look at all these, these initiatives that companies are on to try and drive greater digital engagement, you know, under the umbrella term digital transformation, we're looking at personalized user experiences, optimized operations through, you know, process mining and other things, process automation, uh, something that Mike talked about as being a big thrust going on now, uh, and even launching data products, right? And data-driven data decision-making. Right? The data is everywhere, and, and really, software is the is what's needed to marshal that data. But you know, if we, the reality for a lot of organizations is they're just not there with the data. And I think we've spent a lot of time in the IT community focusing on software practices and software engineering. Um, and then we realize that you know, as we get all this gobs of data, we run into these issues, and there's sort of these these uh, yin and yang issues, right? On one hand. There's a lack of supply of data. Maybe we don't have all the data that we need. On the other hand, maybe we have so much data that it's hard to get quality data. It's hard to get consistent data. It's hard to find the data that we have, right? And another one, you know, on one hand, it's hard to access the data. It might be cryptically hidden or, or you know, just in legacy systems that are hard to break into. And on the other hand, it's hard once you have access to the data to control access to the data. So we've got these dichotomous uh issues going on when it comes to data but nevertheless 
if we really want to follow the path of the digital giants, we have to recognize that they're ultimately data companies, right? I mean, we we might think of Google as, you know, you might cheekily say it's a advertising company because of so much of the revenue coming through advertising. Certainly Facebook is that. But what is the secret ingredient to the advertising business and revenue? It's, it's the data that's used to personalize and target and observe, right? Amazon's business, you know, the early days of Amazon, they had an editorial staff writing book reviews, right? That was wiped out because they were collecting all this customer review data and that's permeated across all their different lines of business. Even the, you know, API darlings like Stripe and, and, and uh, you know, Uber, you know, what is their secret ingredient, right? Stripe isn't putting terminals out in stores um, necessarily. Like the core of their business is co collecting data, offering digital services. Uber is using all sorts of mapping, Google Maps APIs, payments APIs, and so on. But their core, uh, their key differentiator is their ability to do the matchmaking and use, you know, extremely performant data analytic uh, algorithms to determine optimal ride routes and so on. So we may think of software being the center of these companies, but I would argue that it's data. And so this is, I think, a reality that a lot of established organizations are coming to. So, you know, digital transformation, very hyped umbrella term, granted, but there are some, we're, we're at the point now where there's some really good information out there to use in your digital transformation journey. So this is a book by David Rogers, who's a Columbia University professor, extremely practical. He actually has an, a chapter on turning data into assets. And, and he starts by saying, look, you have to shift the way you even think about data if you want to take advantage of it. Because in IT terms, we have kind of looked at data as being something that's expensive. It's a cost item, right? You have to store it. You have to manage it. Um, you know, very, a lot of focus on data modeling and structuring and so on and, and having these different silos of data. And, I, and, and a lot of this makes sense if you're looking in sort of just the application operational system aspect. But when you start to think about data as a capital asset, right, then all of a sudden your, your whole sh mindset has to change, right? You want more data. You want to get as much data as you can, correlate as much data as you can in order to drive value, right? Unstructured data needs to come into the mix. Obviously, it is, right? And and instead of siloing the data, you know, one of the things that I didn't have time to include here is, is a whole talk on how correlating data, bringing it together, drives up, exponentially drives up the value of data. So there's a reason why we want to bring it all together and not just break it all apart. And really always looking at data as this intangible asset to create value. So we can, you know, skipping over all the economics of it, if you'll just uh, take my word that if you analyze data from an economic standpoint, you'll learn that you want to share it broadly within your organizational boundaries in order to correlate it and generate value. You'll want to drive as much consumption as possible in order to um, collect more data, generate more data that can be correlated and create a flywheel effect of, of, of data value. But at the same time, you want to protect it from leaking outside your borders and in, in, in kind of, it, unless, it, except in the cases where you are contextualizing it for consumption, because otherwise you're diminishing the value because the more people that have it, the less value it has. If we look at things really from a more practical standpoint and think about data processing, right? The old world, we had kind of these, these islands of data processing. OLTP, the world of user-facing applications, operational data, lots of terms for it. I'll just call it the application world. And we've got the o OLAP, online analytics processing world, right? Of, of analytics, business intelligence, increasingly now, you know, AI, machine learning, um, data visualization, there's a lot going on. Now, there's another term that I just threw in here, which is the online events processing, which maybe it's not, it's, it's certainly not the equivalent of those in, in the history of computing, but it's got the same characteristics of sort of the application world where things are happening rapidly, they're highly distributed. But if we think about those two worlds, uh, worlds apart, right? The OLAP world, the analytics world, at the same time, 
our application world has been kind of breaking down, analytics has been coming more centralized, right? We've been saying, hey, we need data lakes. Data warehouses aren't enough. We need data lakes to dump all the data that we have. And there's good reason for that, right? You want to have all that data in one place because you don't necessarily know what value you're going to get out of it, right? You're not, you're not sure when you go in, you know, there is this sort of experimental approach to putting the data together and, and cranking it through and coming up with insights. Whereas in the application world, the world probably most of us in the API space have been living in, we've been looking at, we've been focusing on decentralization, right? Microservices, APIs, breaking things apart, distributing, multi-cloud, right? Because we are, you know, a lot of external user-facing functionality that needs to be optimized for, for performance. And these worlds have intersected in the past, but we kind of had this latent approach of, hey, ETL. I threw ELT in there because that's a, that's a thing now in the data world. You can't call it extract, transform, load. It's extract, load, transform. Don't won't get into that here, but this bridge of saying, okay, we need to do some data sharing here, but there can be latency involved because these worlds exist independently. What's happened though is there are forces pushing them together. Right? We've got um, just the, the big data, the possibilities of being able to handle massive amounts of data in super processing speeds means that, hey, we don't have that limitation anymore of waiting and waiting for the batch jobs to finish in order to get the analytics, right? You can actually reasonably create feedback loops of, of processing data and deal with it in real time. That takes away one of the constraints. Machine learning, I think, is a big forcing function here because what is machine learning? It's essentially applications derived from data, right? So you're you're almost coding with data that is a very uh, a very you know, simplified way of looking at it. But there, really, you were taking those insights based on statistical models and creating real time application models that need to be deployed into that application world. On the same hand, you know, what we're doing in the application space with distribution, cloud computing is again, removing constraints that will allow us to run higher scale workloads. But there's also user expectations that are happening that are really being shaped by those companies who are doing data really well to say consumers expect uh, personalized user experiences. They, they have an expectation that, that, you're, that if they've had an interaction with you, you remember and it's gonna factor into their experience. So there's forces pushing things together. And do we, I don't think we really have the answer yet of how those worlds uh, intersect. And if you look at all the trends that are going on right now, and there's a lot of them, right? Um, in the analytics and kind of big data world, you've got cloud data warehouses. I mentioned machine learning, Spark, data lakes. There's a whole field of data engineering that you know has really risen in the last 10 years that is evolving daily. I mentioned the ELT there as being this, the you know, flipping around the letters in the ETL space, which is really, again, how do we deal with these massive data pipelines? Um, sometimes we, we, we unbundle the, the E, L, and the T. In the application world, of course, we've got microservices and microservice architectures going on. That personalization I mentioned, uh, more predict expectation of predictive interactions. There's this thing called reverse ETL. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that which is, hey, we know how to get data from the operational systems into the data lake. What if we take it out, right? That's the reversing the flow. And then in the events world, we've got, you know, eventual consistency kind of, again, removing constraints around transactionality. We've got event sourcing models of new ways of storing data. Uh, and then we've got Kafka's a big deal in event streaming. So these are all, you know, kind of existing in these worlds, but what about what about that intersection? Like, what what are we doing about that? What's the right approach there? If these worlds are going to come together, how do we deal with it? And I think the way to navigate through this is not necessarily to latch on to the, all these emerging technologies because they're coming out all the time. But I like to try. I always like to try and rise above the fray. And to do that, I think we have to focus on value when it comes to. Um, when it comes to looking at data. Because again, I, I, I've got some blogs on this I'll share with everyone, but there's huge economic value in data. And if we focus on value, we can kind of look at, okay, what was that old, what did that, what did that old world look like in, a, in terms of value? 
And in looking at a value chain here, you can kind of think, well, it used to be we, yeah, we get all that data from user facing applications. We'd use batch processes to load it into our data warehouse. We'd perform our business intelligence and analytics processing on it. And we would drive insights. And historically, that might lead to a whole development life cycle before it could ever actually be realized in the operational systems. And so there's a lot of latency in that process, a little more narrow view of the data that we could even deal with. When it comes to the new world, I think what we're seeing is more of a cycle going on. Right? Because we've got the ability to plug things together near, near real time, we have an opportunity to, and you can really start at any point, but let's start on the right. right? First of all, collect data from the user-facing applications, value capture. So I'm, I'm, I'm using some terminology just to pause. Alex Osterwalder, if you've heard of him, he's the uh, creator of the business model canvas. And his definition of a business model is really the way an organization captures, creates, and delivers value. And I think that's a great way of thinking about value in any context, especially in this kind of macro sense. So we capture value from the operational systems in the form of data, feed that in to the analytics processing or machine learning algorithms, whatever uh, the case may be, do that processing then deliver that value by deploying it into those user-facing applications. And the reason this becomes a cycle is as we tighten the latency, as we reduce the latency and tighten the feedback loop between you know, learning from the data and deploying the data, um, one of the amazing things about data is once, once you put it out there to be consumed, uh, you're actually creating more metadata, right? If I put some information out on the web and somebody comes and uses it, I can capture context about that interaction and actually feed that in as more information that makes the data I had more valuable and adds new valuable data. And we keep spinning around and around and around here. And we, now we've really got a powerful feedback loop for data. And this, you know, if you look at, if you think about those digital companies that are web native and whether they're giants like Amazon or um, startups like Stripe, that treating data like, like well, I, I don't, I don't want to say gold because it's bad economic analogy, but but treating data as this incredible source of value is it leads you to, you know, kind of treating it this way and, and capturing it this way. But we still have those those challenges around having those worlds intersect. So just to close on value, right? The the in order to make that data value cycle work, the data has to be fluid. What do we mean by fluid, right? If you have the most data, that doesn't necessarily mean you have the most data value, right? Companies that get the most value out of their data are the ones who are able to take the data and present it in the right context at the right time, right? So. I like to use this concept of data liquidity. It's actually a term that's been out there. Um, certain industry contexts, there was a, I think it was an MIT paper put out a few years ago, really kind of comparing this notion of capital liquidity, asset liquidity, and data liquidity. Um, but I think it's a good thing to strive for. How able is your organization to take the data you have and put it in the shape that's needed for the analytics processing, but then also put it in the shape and the context that's needed for the application processing. So the asset liquidity idea, um, this is a, I'm based in Canada, I'm based in Vancouver, but this is a building in Toronto, uh, going back to the gold thing. Uh, it's, it's the RBC center in Toronto. There's actual gold in, this, in the windows of this building that are listed on the balance sheet for, for RBC to say, hey, we, we've got this much gold in our windows. If they were to actually try and access the value, pretty hard, right? You'd have to pull all the windows down, melt them, extract the gold, not very liquid, right? The most liquid form of capital is cash, is money, right? And we can kind of think about that in terms of data, right? So if, we, if you look at a company in terms of their finances, right, their fiscal operations, um, Liquidity is important in their capital assets because they're exchanging money with their consumers, they're collecting money from their consumers and customers, hopefully. They're transacting with distributors, they're paying for infrastructure, 
um, suppliers, contractors, right? That's on the perimeter of the organization. That's really how uh, capital is exchanged. In the digital world, if we look at the stakeholders that are involved in a digital ecosystem, whether it's user-facing applications or self-service channels, applications or connected devices, third parties, it's APIs that are really that medium for exchanging the data value, right? So I I'm arguing that APIs are the most liquid form of data, much like cash is the most liquid form of capital, right? So I think there's something there. And if we explore that, um, you know, we talk about uh, at MuleSoft, we talk a lot about composable enterprise and the power of composability, the ability to break down capabilities in your organization through APIs so that they can be composed in any context, right? APIs can do the same thing for data, and they obviously have been. But this is fundamental when you think about making your data liquid, making your data able to change shape in order to fit the right context. Right. So composable data is liquid data, liquid data in the way that we want. We're striving for data liquidity in order to maximize data value. And you know, in fact, Gartner has been talking recently about the importance of composability. And it's something that Mike talked about in his keynote about modularity and the way that the whole uh, industry and the digital economy are going. So we actually had an experience last year at the dawn of the pandemic where um, the Salesforce, Tableau, MuleSoft team um, kind of jumped into action saying, hey, well, how, how can we help deal with this pandemic? And that joint team built a data platform to say, you know, we don't even, we're not even sure which data is going to be valuable, but we want to just get the data out there into people's hands because maybe it will help. And there was actually a few iterations around starting with thinking maybe PPE and other data would be valuable, but essentially landed on case data, you know, and, and um, policy data around reopening plans and managing you know, local policies as being the data that people wanted the most. But we built this platform in a very API-led way, meaning we kind of abstracted all the backend data sources through APIs in order to collect the data. We had a normalized data warehouse with this information and offered kind of a, I, I don't want to use the term canonical, but kind of a standardized uh, set of entities that were the core of the data that was being shared. But then all these different channels, whether it was through Tableau uh, for data visualization, whether it was through partners who were, who were kind of sucking in the data into their own systems, Salesforce launched an application called work.com to help organizations deal with it, deal with reopening and, and policies in their regions. We had partners building applications and we also just had an open public API. And in all of those cases, we found that we needed to offer different views of the data to fit those different contexts. So we kind of had these crude, raw data APIs, the back end, um, these kind of core APIs in the middle, and these contextualized APIs for the channels of distribution. And we found that this was extremely powerful architecture because we were able to, on the back end, add lots of new data sources. I think we started with two, and, and right now there's about 20. Um, and also we're able to add channels rapidly and make changes dynamically to channels without having to change the core that was in the middle. And so we kind of generalized this architecture to look at how APIs can help with this intersection. So if we look on the left and think about an OLAP you know, data pipeline that was, is typical in the data engineering space where you're ingesting data, preparing it, storing it, analyzing it, deploying it. And then we think about the kind of multi-channel distributed applications we have on the right we can generalize this and think about what are the crude data APIs that we need in order to source the data? What are the contextualized data APIs that we need in order to fit the needs of each channel system, each user touch point, um, each ex you know, user experience? But the key to the whole thing, I think, is it's tempting to just dump the data into those contextualized approaches but it's this layer of abstraction of having the core, right? Having the composable core that makes the whole thing work. And that can come 
either pre-analysis or post-analysis. And in this model, we can see that you know as we collect more information about how the data is being consumed in those contextual in those contexts of user-facing applications, we feed that back in and get more value out of that data. And, and again, keep increasing the value of the data we have. So I'm, you know, if you've heard our API-led connectivity term, I'm calling this API-led data connectivity. The layered approach works very well when it comes to capabilities and kind of supporting process automation. In this case, it's really about supporting liquid data. And we can see even how we can capture value through the crude data APIs. You know, there's a big process there to turn it into the core data APIs where we can create value and then ultimately deliver the value through the contextualized data APIs and then keep collecting it and running it through the flywheel again and again and again. Now, just one last thing. Um, you know, we I think that one of the things we're going to see Mike talked a lot about programming the network. I think if we get away from worrying about, hey, where are we storing the data and think more about from the consumer standpoint, how are they going to access the data? Um, managing the network of data, if we think about these APIs as the data plane, right? we can impose a control plane across a data network that's normalized through APIs that allows us to do all these other system-wide functions of discoverability, deployment, scaling, and so on on the list. I know I'm tight on time, so, and just to summarize, make sure you focus on data value, not volume, right? Aim for measuring data liquidity as a, a way of looking at how well your organization is gonna drive value. APIs fit here, although it might be SQL in the, in the data engineering pipelines, APIs are really the, the touch points on the perimeter of the organization. And think about building a data network through APIs and managing it as a network. With that, I've got some additional resources, but uh, Satya, I'd love to hear if there are any questions. Yeah, great talk, Matt. Uh, yeah, so so the journey to, uh, one question, uh, mm -hmm. so the journey to create a data value or the gold data that you called, what are the most common industry challenges the companies are facing today to mold their data? I, it's, this is one of those questions where I'd like to ask a, a question response around the industry in the sense of the technology industry or industry in terms of the vertical industry that you might be working within. I think it might be the technology industry. I, I think I'll, I'll say this because I'll try and answer both regardless of what the answer is. I think that um, the big challenge is I've kind of represented it on this macro scale. I think that there's a temptation for people to work in big horizontal chunks, right? Where they're trying to say, let's like get all the data in one place and then let's do all the machine learning. And like, I think it's better to really always think about with this, with this focus on value, let's look at a business outcome that might be powered by this model and take a thinner vertical slice of this whole thing and say, Let's find the data that we need for a particular use case. Let's run it through our pipeline. Um, let's feed it into our operational systems. Let's create that tight feedback loop on a smaller scale as a way of um, experimenting and also delivering more of an incremental business value. So in other words, maybe don't try and sort out every data problem for your organization at once, right? Like to kind of, kind of build by momentum because quite frankly, in the startup world, in the web native world, that's how things kind of arise. They're 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 running small experiments and kind of uh, building momentum over time to get to the big picture. Perfect. Yes. Um, and what's your opinion in terms of like we we are talking in the industry about APIs as a products and data as a products, but I don't think those two are doesn't exist without one without the other, I believe. What's your what's your take? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. I think I, I, when we talk about API APIs as products, it's a you know, there's a whole other discussion we had on that. But you're you're right that the a lot of the times data is a big part of the API product. In fact, you could say a lot there are API products out there that are really data products just packaged through APIs. Um, there are other products that are you know capability products that have a data element and they're packaged through APIs. 
So I think it's it's good for us to recognize that there are digital products. There are definitely digital products. And a lot of times APIs are involved in the packaging. But I think as we all know, it's not about the API, right? It's, what, it's about what the API enables. And I think that um, without jumping on too much of a tangent, one thing, one of the things that's maybe uh, uh, follows from this conversation is companies that are really looking at how do I build an API product? How do I launch an API product? How do I, mon especially how do I monetize my API products? A lot of times the monetization can come in phase two and it actually comes out of that digital feedback loop of collecting insights that no one else has that, that are actually high value to either existing consumers or, or new new consumers. So I think that for those you know who are looking at building commercial products through APIs, you really need to have this data value cycle going well in order to 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 build differentiated products. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, great insights on turning data into assets. So wonderful. Okay. Thanks for uh, Thank being with us today. All right. Take care.